All right. Welcome to Comic Talkers, where talk comics are always the top of our discussion. I'm Mary. And I'm Brandon. And welcome back to another History Through Comics segment. Now, we have a bit of a different one for you guys today. So instead of necessarily looking at a comic that talks about a true historical event, event or um, that is inspired by a true historical event, we're actually looking at a comic that talks about a mythologized history. Um, and we are looking at a retelling of part of the Volsinga saga. So we are looking at Siegfried Dragon Slayer, um, written by Malk Arl Mark Allard Will and illustrated by Jasmine Redford. Um, this is a really, really cool comic. Um, the Volsinga saga is part of obviously Norse mythology. So Scandinavian mythology focusing primarily on Denmark, um, Sweden and Norway. Um, Finland is a little different. They are technically Scandinavian because it's a language demographic but um so we're looking at this story um which some of you guys might know is part of the inspiration behind such famous piece of works as lord of the rings or wagner's the ring cycle um and it does in some ways play a role too in the formation of like a um, germanic national mythology that we see in the 19th century towards the unification of germany especially when pulling from the northern german states for inspiration um, now, this is a story about um, a Scandinavian prince, um, Siegfried, who we know to be hot-headed. He is searching for vengeance for to avenge his father's murder, and there are some twists and turns along the way. Um, he encounters Odin. He kills an entire kingdom, <laughs> is betrayed by someone he thought to be a loyal friend and servant, and kills a dragon. And also places a curse upon himself, all in. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, you really see the similarities to Lord of the Rings, and particularly the One Ring, when we get to the actual bits of the story that focus on the ring, which comes in like the latter third. Mm -hmm. um, and But we're also seeing a lot of things that would remind you and are part of Richard Wagner's The Ring Cycle. Um, which details the quest for this magical ring. Um, and there are even themes specifically about Siegfried from the opera. Yeah. Um, and what this book really kind of focuses on um, is we're actually, there's most of the story doesn't so much focus on the mythology. Odin is in it for maybe a second. There's not a whole lot of magic even in the story obviously there's a dragon and there's a curse but for the most part the story is about wars between states and the concept of corrupting corrupting power and vengeance so yeah I, first off too like what was it one of the things that so mary was the one pitched this idea to me i did not know anything about this mythology whatsoever because i'm a u.s history major so outside that i'm just like okay i don't really want to learn but i will admit um, for fans who want to get into new comics, everything, go pick up your copy. This is so fantastic to read. Art is what got me right into it. Right, the art is so cool. Yeah. Um, something that I learned when I was talking to um, Mark, who is the writer um, at the small press expo that I was at, is that all of the color is achieved in this comic through painting with coffee. Right. Um, and it adds this kind of incredible glow. Um, it's still a very beautiful thing to see and it's gorgeous yeah the the coffee stainage and everything like that or the coffee painting kind of just makes it look like it's gold and that's what makes yeah, it it's fantastic so yeah but to get this story started off um we see two characters introduced to us Siegfried or Sigurd isn't it Sigurd in the main mythology the Sigurd it's his father yeah yeah Sigurd or Sig so it's Siegfried and uh, Sigmund right. Sigurd yeah it's and lots then, of names lots of s names in this um sorry if we butchered those names but we'll try our best um we have Siegfried and we have Regan um but Regan is more the um kind of like his ally at this point he's you're going to see his story develop later on um but he's trying to train him they're pretty much they're in training him how to do proper attacks but you know the scene isn't as important but the main importance is you get to see Siegfried's personality and you can see Siegfried kind of more like a spoiled brat it's something that you 
that I don't care about this. I'm going to win. And then every time he loses, you know, he just gets all pissed off, walks away, gets all mad about it. Um, you know, of course, he gets all pissed off. And the fact that Regan brings up that, you know, that he reminds him that the king has charged him with the task of training him um, for all facets of your royal life. Um, and it is your responsibility to learn. And then he goes, not to mention walking away is cowardly. So, of course, you kind of see Siegfried, like, of course, he's walking away still from everything. And then all of a sudden, when he says cowardly, it's it's that whole thing of, I'm, you know, I'm this, I'm this. You're not going to demote me like that. So he gets back into the fighting, everything like that. So, again, this, and Siegfried (laughs) comes out victorious this round when he goes back, picks up his sword, and takes out Regan. Um, Now, of course, they win, everything like that. So it gets late. They go back to the castle. Now, during this night, Reagan um, has a dream, and it's about this ring. Um, he picks up a ring. Everything looks fine, and he states, there you are, my pretty. I've been waiting for you, but now you're mine and mine alone. All of a sudden, you see this dragon really appear out of the gold, shouting out no with Reagan waking up, scared out of his mind. If you don't already see The Hobbit in this story just with that scene alone, I don't know what else to tell you because that is pretty much Bilbo or the dwarves with uh, Smog. And so you kind of see that mythology really grow. But So he goes to um, Siegfried the next morning, um, tells the lady or calls – I don't like that name, so I'm not even going to say it. I don't like when people call them. <laughs> uh-huh. um, he pretty much tells her to leave. Um, that he needs to speak to the prince alone. And so Siegfried getting pissed off, he's just like, what's the purpose of this? Everything like that. Now, Reagan comes in and says, forgive me. It's just that I must speak with you urgently. So he, Siegfried tells him to take a seat. Now, Reagan goes on to say, I've heard tales of a wretched dragon that terrifies the eastern coast. Forgive me, my lord, but I feel like a noble as honorable as yourself can free the lands from such a beast. And Siegfried kind of laughs it off. A, dra- a dragon sounds like a fairy tale to me, Reagan. And he goes, fine. But Reagan responds with, but pray tell, how should I tell the peasants on the coast that the prince will not free them from the clutches of the dragon Fafnir? Not to mention, they say that the dragon sits on enough gold for a prince to forge his name across all of Denmark. That is unless you're too good for Denmark. So he finds ways to finally... Kind of like you see that manipulation really coming into play. Yeah, and it paints Siegfried too as very much a reluctant hero. Yes. Um, he is very much a figure that is comfortable with his princely life and life at court, where the responsibilities placed on him are very low because he's not in charge. He is very much still a child. Um, we get the impression he can't really be older than like 14, 15, right. just based on how he's acting. Um and we haven't even encountered his parents yet. Now, that was something, we'll get to that here too soon because I want to kind of question that because if I'm not mistaken, there are some things that are different from the, the original tale compared to the comic because I, with especially with his parents being involved. But I, I want to get to that here in a little bit. But after doing that, he gets the row out of Siegfried and he states, I'm a prince and a bull son. Son of the feared Sigmund, no less. If anyone can slay this Fafnir, it is Siegfried. I, Siegfried. I'll get a horse, you'll see. But pretty much he tells me, you need to get a horse, you need to do this, and yet you don't have all this. And you, you want to sit here and do that. So Reagan, Reagan gets up very well, and he says, and he reminds him to forge him a sword strong enough to penetrate the dragon's hide. So that's why I said, just that scene alone that page panel right here i can kind of show it here because this one actually doesn't have text but you can see it a little bit easier just that art alone gets me intrigued a lot and because you see the dark side of him plus the light side of him so you know something's not right here we've already got a lot of foreshadowing particularly about reagan um, and we're getting a stronger sense of the kind of character he is and how exactly he's trying to shape siegfried into what he wants and what he thinks a king should be yeah so you know of course Siegfried marches in after this um to the palace where his mom the queen and 
his adoptive father um, sits on the throne. And pretty much he comes in and says he demands a horse. Um, and, of course, the king at the time says, how is a noble prince expected to get around without his noble steed? Now, this is where I want to ask, because if I'm not mistaken, isn't Reagan his adoptive father and not his parents in the original tale? So that is a great question. It's been a very long time since I've actually read the Volsung saga. Um, so there's this concept in a lot of early medieval societies. So this is particularly true in Ireland, and this concept extends into the Norse cultures as well, um, of fosterage, um, where there are like step parents. So like Siegfried's father, Def Siegfried's father is dead and his mother remarried, mm -hmm. um, which makes the current king his stepfather. But there's also this concept of fosterage where young men in particular are placed into the care of other typically nobles mm -hmm. um, who train them and raise them alongside their own families and what's essentially like a noble men's apprenticeship mm -hmm. um, where they're like, like part of the family but they're not part of the family it's a complicated thing um, I have a few books on it that I could share with you if you're really interested in reading them um but again it's one of those complicated situations where it's like yes and no but also like there's a lot of complicated family things happening for Siegfried and this is the kind of the deficit of coming into this story um without having read Sigmund's tale yeah um they're really shoving us in in the middle of the cycle here um they're wanting to focus on Siegfried um, and sort of this teenage coming of age story where we're grappling with ideas of power and resilience and what it means to become a mature person, as opposed to really understanding the backdrop of where the story is. Right. That That's where I think that's a great point for me. I didn't come from that. So it was learning it this way and then researching really the tale after. So that's why I was questioning, because I know like they'd say in the... It, there's many adaptations of this too. So that's yes, what- Yes, and there's a few different versions of it as well. Yeah, so that's what- um, And that's one of the great things about um, this book that I really appreciated is that before we even get to the author's foreword, um, he says, the author of this book would like to acknowledge the English translations of the Volsunga saga, which aided in the understanding of the source mythology. For further reading, the translations by the following are recommended. And then he lists- Mm -hmm. six different translations of the text yeah so i am going to buy those books now because i'm <laughs> reading this comic to see more into this but we continue on of course the king tells him yeah we need to get you a stag or you get you a, a horse or a steed so he sends some of his soldiers out with siegfried as they're out to on their land trying to find a horse for him um, but they come across a stag now of course you know, he can't pass up an opportunity, so it kind of just shows you kind of like his pride or his, like, oh, I can't pass something like this up, you know, or all this. And what happens is he shoots the arrow, but is stopped by what looks like, I hate, I'm going to just say it, Gandalf, um, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> this is pretty much straight up Gandalf, but we know it is, if I'm not mistaken, this is Odin. If this I'm... is Odin, and we find, we find this out, it's not confirmed for us at this point in the text, yes. but later in the text where we're shown flashbacks of Odin interacting with other characters, it's the exact same figure. Yes, so he comes up pretty much, of course, Siegfried freaking out, like, what's going on, and pretty much asking, what's the meaning of this, where did the stag go, and pretty much forget that, where did you come from, and he pretty much demands him to answer him. Um, of course, Odin tells, or, or this strange figure tells him hey relax friend i wish you no ill will um, i hear on the winds that you've been seeking a horse worthy of your nobility um and pretty much trick is kind of like how do you know this all this and he goes i have had as i have said whispers of the wind if you've looked beyond your simple frustrations boy and over to see my west over to my west you'll see grain or gran or granny is that correct granny or grain yeah it's um right i've been pronouncing it gran uh, that might not be correct but, um and i think this particular interaction is something that i really enjoyed for a lot of reasons because after the old man disappears mm -hmm. siegfried says where in the name of odin did he go and 
one of the things I really appreciate about this is that it takes a more human approach to understandings of religion in the past, yeah. um, where obviously if we look today, not everyone is a religious zealot, um, but there's this sort of assumption made that in the medieval period or the ancient world that everyone was kind of zealous mm -hmm. about the dominant faith in their culture. Um, but we see Siegfried very much towing this line in between like, yeah, it's a cultural thing, but like, whatever. Um and like we said, he does disappear. What was he pretty much asked him, like, what if, if I wished you ill will, wouldn't I have already tried to do something like this? Or shouldn't you extend the same gratitude as what I'm doing to you? And so when they um, tell Can you show an old fool the maturity of goodwill? Yeah. And so when he tells his archers to put his, their bows down, he disappears. And then that's when Grant comes up to him and tells him, let's get you back to the castle. Now, they go back to the castle. Um, of course, um, Siegfried writing on top of Graham, um, and he goes out to see Reagan. Of course, he wants to see how this sword's coming out, and he goes, Reagan goes, you, you're your sword, my liege, and he goes, you know, you've outdone this time, you know, fine sword, so he goes. So Siegfried decides to lift the sword up and about to smash it, and he goes, you know, Reagan, of course, stops him, and he goes, w what are you doing? And he goes, well, if the sword is to cut through dragon's hide, then securely it can glide through an anvil with this anvil with ease. Well, smashes it into the anvil and it breaks into several pieces. Um, of course, he gets all pissed off, threatens to execute him at this point for not doing what he says. And But this is where things get interesting because he goes, you know, Reagan tells him get you know to get his finger out of his face. If you know of any metal stronger than forged steel, then I beg of you to find it for me. And Siegfried goes on and says, Mother did mention something about some kind of an, of an indestructible sword. Um, of course, I love the little tie back that Siegfried kind of tells him about the dragon. And Reagan says it about the sword. That sounds like a fairy tale to me. Of course, Siegfried, wanting to prove this, his pride gets in the way, goes, I'm going to return and show you. So he goes to his mom. So pretty much he goes and requests her to talk about, you know, father's sword. Of course, she knew this day was going to come. So she pulls out a box that has the severed sword of his father's. Um, and you can see it's in pieces, everything like that. Now, this is where we get the unique story. Um, not going to lie, this gives me sort of the stone box um anyway but it's not the point a little bit yeah it's yeah. again there's a lot of syncretism that this book alludes to between different cultures so of course when we're looking at arthurian myth which is the sword and the stone myth mm -hmm. um that's coming from medieval literature that's not necessarily this ancient story that we all assume it is the earliest written down versions of the arthuriana come from the mabinogion which is brythonic myth um and that's Wales and Brittany, which are on the east coast of Great Britain and the west coast of France, respectively. Um, and both of which were definitely invaded by Vikings in the early medieval period. Um, and there is a lot of Saxon and Anglo, Anglo-Saxon and Norse syncretism in the folklore of the British Islands. Obviously, we see this most specially in Ireland and Scotland, but it definitely extends further south due to the raiding seasons. Um, and this is something that I found found really, really interesting. And we're going to see a little bit more about this throughout this flashback. Is it referencing, it's showing not just connections to other well-known myths. Of course, everyone in modern culture knows about pulling the sword from the stone and Excalibur and this indestructible sword that no one can beat. Um, very similar <laughs> yeah to this sword which was pour, put into a tree um but there's also other syncretism with other cultures that the vikings invaded um it's very much giving a larger cultural picture of the extent of viking invasion but also the extent of cultural exchange caused by the raiding season right because i think we, people often forget exactly how far the vikings traveled um it wasn't... We tend to think of them as centralized to this one location, but there's Viking artifacts in the Middle East. Um, there's Viking artifacts that made it as far as Asia along trade routes. We They're some of the mightiest seafarers in world history for a reason. 
Well, they're also what was it? The original was <laughs> one of the first people to ever land or come in, in North America. So at this point, even before Columbus, at this point, so yeah, so they they were everywhere. Now, um, and their influence can be felt in a lot of different places, and that's why we we find so much cultural exchange among the Norsemen. Um, and so it's really interesting to see what we now think of myths or concepts belonging to certain cultures being portrayed in this story. Right. Um, so the syncretism was what I find really fascinating about this because it the comic even has a footnote in this flashback that directly addresses syncretism, um, which for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, I realize I've been using that for the past few minutes and I'm not sure if anyone <laughs> listening knows what that means. <laughs> um, so syncretism is the blending of two cultures. Um, so typically this is happening during periods of conversion. This is happening um, along borders of multiple countries, multiple cultures, um, when ethnic groups are forced to cohabitate. 90% um, of the time this is happening peacefully. This can also happen in times of duress. Um, essentially, we're just looking at the blending of cultures and the sharing of not only cultural norms, but also cultural stories, music, traditions, so on and so forth. Yeah. So what was it? Like we said, we continue on, um, like, like Mary was saying that pretty much Odin or this mysterious figure that Siegfried just met, um, comes into this flashback, sticks a sword in a, in a tree trunk and states the one who pulls the sword from the tree will claim it as their own. Graham, the sword of the gods. And of course, everybody's kind of, you know, memorized by the, everybody tries to even King Seeger, um, strode up to the trunk and could not pull it. He could even budge it. Um, um, his only achievement, that's what I love, is his, was to chaff his hands in the desperation to claim the sword of his own. Um, but we see somebody off to the side, and she states, Sigmund, your father, watched the noblemen and revealers try to pull the sword free, and one by one he watched them fail. So he decides to go up there, and he pulls it without ease. He, he has no problem. He pulled it out, got it out, and now he is the owner of the sword. Um, but we find out, too, is that people try to buy his sword, even with gold, and he refuses it. He's just like, I'd rather have this. I'd rather be, a, you know, pretty much be the warrior he needs to be. Not, He's not out for fame. And, of course, King, King Seyfried did not take well to this. Um you know, of course, it angered him, and in the very moment, Seeger began to plot your father's demise to steal Graham from his cold dead. Of course, this is where you see Siegfried kind of show his attitude again. How long is this story going to take? And we really see Siegfried's youth highlighted throughout this entire comic, um, which is something that is is highlighted in some ways in the myth, but not quite to this extent. Yeah. Um, youth is often shown as a way to describe folly in the myth, whereas here it's more a part of the narrative. It's not necessarily a fault. It's more to show Siegfried's humanity within the story. Now, of course, his mom continues on with the story and says, in the end, King Sieger, your father's very own brother-in-law, kidnapped and imprisoned your father and all eight of his brothers in the forest outside Seeger's kingdom. It was then that he stole Graham for himself. To rid himself of the burden of vengeance, Seeger allowed his mother to transform to into a wolf and fulfill her bloodlust by feasting upon the shackled brothers one night at a time until pretty much she, when of course Siegfried asks how and he goes after all eight of his brothers have been eaten your father's turn came the wolf's terrible howls came, could be heard drifting on the breeze between the trees but your father's sinister sister Signy had a trick up her sleeve she sent her one of her servants to smear honey over your father's face Sigmund knew this had knew his time had come King Seeger's mother was upon him and you see this wolf come up to him of course, wolf cannot cannot. Um, what's the right word to say? Resist the yeah. sweetness of the honey, and rather than bite, begins to lick. Which leads to Sigmund the opportunity to grab her tongue and sort of 
take control of the situation and free himself. Um, and this was this was something I found really fun uh, because this is very much a reference to um, the ancient and medieval Norse concept of berserkers, uh, which I think most of us are familiar with. They're warriors who would wear bear or wolf skins, and it was meant to allow them to assume the qualities of that animal in combat. Um, but this also points to another thing where women were not excluded from combat in um, ancient and medieval Norse society. Um, and so the fact that they're not only showing us berserkers, but they're specifically highlighting a female queen as a berserker is just really fun for me. Um, I enjoy that a lot. But I'm also just, I think berserkers are cool. I think it's a really interesting concept to explore. And it's something that we can see in multiple different cultures where animal skins are used to either inspire or to imbue a warrior with the abilities or powers associated with said animal. Um, and wolves have a particular weight in um, Norse culture and mythology. Um, of course, looking at Fenrir, who helps bring about Ragnarok. Um, which is something that happens at like the end of the ring cycle. Um, <laughs> and it's cyclical, so it all starts over again. Um, so this is definitely alluding to different parts of the grander narrative of the Volsunga saga um, that, that we just don't have because the story only focuses on Siegfried. Um, so the, the different pieces of the saga that the writer is pulling from are really interesting um, and knowing the myth and knowing information about the culture, it's really interesting to see what he's choosing to highlight and what he's choosing to skip over. Um, highly recommend reading both the comic and the saga yeah. to get the best picture of this. Now, Sigmund um, actually escapes. Now, he is victorious, kills the wolf that does try to eat him. And what was it by? But pretty much separating the tongue from the head and letting it bleed out so he escapes and comes across this little cabin now we see a man also there another i believe that's another berserker if i'm not mistaken he has his wolf skin literally laying on top of him and as he's trying to get food or he's trying to get warm and everything of course wolf wakes up and here he comes out and he starts to fight again or fight well that's big... actually um what we see there is yeah that's another berserker so i thought we were a little bit ahead of where we were i'm not sure why my brain just completely skipped <laughs> this you're, part you're <laughs> good. uh but yeah they pretty much he grabs the sword of the, of the berserker and stabs him and he lays there or pretty much they it doesn't kill him but of course the berserker still continues his attack and he lunges at him where siegfried again stabs him again and kills him now he realizes though that it was only as the wolf lay dying that he realized the gravity of a mistake as it transferred back into the woodsman um, because he sees this guy laying there with the wolf skin on top of him and he thinks it's a wolf that's attacking him when it's really the woodsman um, now he takes the skin of the wolf and starts to head back to King Siegfried for his vengeance. Now, he does go to see Siegfried, and he thinks, this is what I find so interesting, is that he thinks his mother is who's returning. But it's not him. And he goes, you're not my mother, and it isn't it's you, isn't it? And he goes off and kills King Siegfried. Now, or Sigurd, or yeah, I can't. Yeah, Sigurd. Sigmund is killing Sigurd, who and Sigmund is the father of Siegfried. Yeah, there's a lot of S names that all sound very similar. <laughs> so, um, now she, you know, of course, it goes back to present time, and she goes, "Now, before I hand the shards of this great sword over to you, it's important to that you understand something. It's important you understand the power of this sword, so you may avoid the perils that claimed your father's life." And she goes on, with an indestructible weapon that Graham at his side, your father, a Dane, saw a way to put German centuries of internal conflict to rest. But such a lofty ideals always come with a bloody price tag. 
Once silence had fallen on over Germany's many battlefields, your father did one final thing to bring about an age of peace, married me. He claimed it was to build an unbreakable alliance or allegiance with my father, King Ilmi. I'm going to pronounce names wrong, so I do apologize, but I saw the shine of true love in his eyes. But when the when a princess marries, sometimes there is a jilted suitor. Please, you know, of course, it goes on to pretty much talk about his demise and that this other guy that was supposed to be betrothed to her is now going to go and pretty much attack this city. Yeah, and of course, what we're seeing here, too, is we're looking at a way to put Germany's centuries of internal conflict to rest. Now, for those of us that are familiar with, um, I'm calling it modern German history, this typically starts in about the year 1600. We look at the modern era as starting at the end of the Renaissance, at like the Renaissance and a bit forward. Um, but we're looking here specifically at 19th century German history uh, because, of course, German unification happens in 1871. Um, and this was supposed to be what put an end to Germany's centuries of internal conflict between the various warring Germanic states. Um, and there were different agreements on how it should be. There was Klein Deutschland and Gross Deutschland, um, depending on which German speaking states would be joining this union um, to create what we now know as Germany. Um, and one way that they did this was in the formation of a national German mythology, a lot of which was fabricated. Mm -hmm. um, they would just make things up. But a lot of what they also did was they pulled from the syncretic Germanic and Norse mythology found to the north, um, which included bits of the Volsunga saga. So we're seeing references to this here. And in this flashback too, we're seeing Lingi. Lingi. Yeah. Lingi. Um, or Langi. It's one of the two. Um, who makes a sacrifice to now it's referenced as Wotan, uh, or Votan, who is the Germanic adaption of Odin. So there are a lot of similarities between Germanic and Norse mythology, but they are not the same. Yeah. Um, but there are some equivalencies that can be made between them when we're directly comparing cultures and deities. Um, and Odin and Wotan are one of those similarities that we can directly pull from. So it even says Wotan was the German equivalency of Odin. Kind of like if we're looking at Greek and Roman, obviously the deities are different, there are a lot of similarities between them still. They cover different, they cover the same things, but they have very different mythologies. That's sort of the situation that's happening here as well, um, where due to cultural exchange um, and the movement of peoples that the traditions have sort of evolved um, into different things that still have a common point of origin. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Really cool stuff. Um, again, syncretism is fascinating to read about. Um, there's a lot of scholarship on it, particularly um, as more historians in the current historiography of the medieval world are looking more into cultural exchange and they're looking more into um, similarities between legal codes and um, specifically um, religion. It's there, A lot of really cool stuff is happening in the historiography of medieval Europe right now. It's really exciting. Um, <laughs> So, but what yeah. we're seeing here is just a lot of that sort of referencing. So it's looking at not just the idea that the lofty ideals of putting Germany's warring history to peace comes with a bloody price tag, which obviously, if you know anything about the history of modern Europe, what happened after 1871? <laughs> a lot of really bad things is what happened. Um, and where it's there's just a lot of things that he's referencing here that are and of course the writer is um a european native he's from england um so this is the kind of history that he grew up with um so he is definitely intimately familiar with things like world war one which comes out of the weimar republic which is the creation of the german unification of 71 
Um, and so we see him like directly referencing these things, but looking at them in the from the viewpoint of the past and looking at this larger history, but referencing a more modern history from that. Um, there's a lot of layers to what he's doing here that's really fun to talk about. Now, she continues on with the story because, of course, Siegfried wants to know what has happened at this point. And she continues on to say, your father sent me to safety of the woods in hopes we be reunited once the dust settled. But she continues on, but that's the thing about surprise attacks. They lead defending forces with little time to prepare. As such, King Linguine's men cut down those of my father, King Alimi, with ease. And, of course, we see um, Sigmund and Linguine, or Linguine, um, Lingi, um, get into a fierce fight and where Sigmund is killed. Now, something I want to bring up in this, because I think it's a great point to bring up, um, this is known to be a Viking strategy. The fact being that they're going in, foul swoop, try to get somebody out quick before they know that they're coming. It was a very effective way. If you like, I'm I know I usually try to stay away from anime, but there is a great anime manga that focuses on this, and it's called Vinland Saga. And during that whole process, you see how fast and how swift those Vikings move, and that is a true statement. Those guys came in ready to attack, ready to go to war at any time. But you'd also see in that manga too that they actually made treaties with different countries to defend them. So different clans had different treaties. Some worked with England, some worked with different countries to protect them. So it's interesting to see it. But the point is, is that pretty much Sigmund does die in this case at the hands of King Linguine. Now, and it's also interesting to note that the supposedly unbreakable sword, the sword of the gods, lays in pieces. Um, if you are familiar with Lord of the Rings, this should ring some bells for you. One thing I want to bring up, too, is what she states about this story is that in that very moment, Odin thrust his holy spear of Gungir, shattering Graham before it could even reach King Linguine. So it shows you that even the gods can turn on something that quick. And Odin tend to be that type of god of what we know in mythology. Um, and it does kind of speak to the more transactional nature of what we know of these ancient religions where it's not so much oh if i give you like if i just adore you you're going to do what i want um it's more what are you going to give to the deity so that they will provide for you um and whoever gives more is going to receive more favor is the way that this is often working um so it's a lot of really good insight into how the ancient religion works without focusing on the ancient religion because again odin's barely there now again <laughs> we see sigmund laying there to die pretty much he's dying right now of course um Ejordis comes to her or the the mom of siegfried um and she pretty much says, he pretty much says to her that he needs to tell her something. She needs to listen to him and that he needs, she needs to take these pieces of Graham so our son can inherit it one day. And it looks like she never knows. And that's why I was going to ask you too, is this part of the mythology where she never knew she was pregnant? Yes. Um, so this is a really common thing in um, ancient mythologies. Um, so this happens not just in Norse mythology, but there's also a story in Irish mythology, the conception of Bress, where his father looks at his mother and goes, well, we're going to have a son and you're going to name him XYZ. Or um, that happens too with, I'm more familiar with Irish mythology than I am with Norse, mm -hmm. but the conception of Monk and McLear looks at the woman he just slept with and says, you're going to have a son, you're going to name him this. Yeah. Um, and that's pretty common, um, especially for these mythologies. Um, doesn't happen, and to my knowledge, as often in Norse mythology as it does in Irish mythology, um, but it's definitely still a common theme that we see kind of across the board. Right. Now, of course, this does lead, of course, to him dying, um, and with this, she pulls, finally shows the shards of the sword and tells her, you know, Siegfried starts questioning a lot of things and the fact that how was father able to predict that you were pregnant with me and she goes you I fear you're missing the point of this tale my son Graham is not just a mere sword but a deadly weapon one that you must be incredibly careful with wield it with such 
with too much brutality, flaunt it freely, and it will incur the envy of men whom you whom will seek to pry it from your cold, dead fingers. But Siegfried goes on and asks the question, so tell me, mother, has our family ever sought vengeance upon King Ling or Lingi? And she goes, of course not. Your pretty much tells him no, because of the fact being it's not wise. And of course, him getting pissed just shows his immaturity again, the fact being that. But what I love here, too, and I'm going to kind of skip a little bit, because that's when the king steps in. And says, no, we're not going to attack them because of the fact being like we haven't survived this long by wearing with everybody or wearing with everyone who upsets us. I will not see our diplomacy abed away by, chi by childish anger. My armies are off bounds to you. So I'll take your sword and leaves. Now, I know I missed it's... some of the texts and stuff, but it's one of those things that shows you that Siegfried wants to avenge his father at this point that and it's a father he's never met in a legacy he doesn't really know as we can tell by the fact that his mother has just had to tell him about his father for the first time um so it's very much showing his immaturity um and how he isn't prepared to lead right he is not it really shows you too that reagan has been tasked with training him to become a ruler and it shows you how much Reagan has failed in that regard. Right. So again, another thing that we're going to see, Reagan is not what we think he's going to be. Um, but we do see him talking about Reagan. Um, Siegfried does go to him and brings this magical sword to him and says, pretty much asks him to, to reforge it. Um, and pretty much told him, reforge it, and you'll see that this is magical more than you realize. And of course, you know, Reagan takes the challenge, of course, reforges the the weapon. And, and I love this. The proof is in the pudding. So he takes the blade. Siegfried takes the blade. It's a beautiful blade, Re or Reagan. Now let's see if it's worthy of Graham. Now he swings it up just like he does the first sword and slices through it like butter. Yep, yeah, right through the anvil. Yeah. So as you say, Reagan, the proof is in the pudding. So of course. Reagan kind of goes off and, of course, trying to manipulate the situation again, asking if he's going to seek out the dragon Fafnir now. But Siegfried has other plans first, and then he'll take care of them. Now, what we see is that, of course, like his father or his adoptive father just has stated, that his army's off balance. Well, his army doesn't know that. So Siegfried goes to his men. And states that the right the revelry ends now for tonight we are destined to sail to the cold embrace of war. And of course they ask, where are they gonna sail? We we free Danish men wage war against King Liguin and the Saxons, the treacherous dog and of the hunting clan, a man who shames my Volsung bloodline by going free from retribution for the murder of my father. Of course, one of the guy questions him and says. What does the king have to say about this? With Siegfried responding, do you question my nobility? And they, of course they say no. And they decide to sail out that night. Pretty much they all take off. But here's the king looking out the window and notices it. And I love it. It seems your son believes I was born yesterday. Yeah, it's I think, too, there is this kind of understanding between his the king and his mother where they knew he was going to do it anyway. Yeah. Um, Because it's clear that they know Siegfried and what he's like. Otherwise, they would not have reacted as strongly to him being angry. Yeah. Um, And to the fact that Siegfried is leveraging his nobility in order to not be questioned um, is something that we don't really see. Of course, we don't really see his parents at all. Right. But it's not, we don't get the impression that they would do that. Right. Now, they only do it when they're trying to prevent Siegfried from making a foolish mistake. We don't see them do it when they're trying, like, they're willing to give him a horse, um, but they're not. And they make, it's almost like a joke when they say, what's a, what's, you know, what's a noble prince without his noble steed? That's like a laugh thing. Right. It's different. It's a completely different tone when they're trying to use their nobility to stop him from engaging in something foolish. Um, 
Now, we do state, he states later on the king does, and he goes, he's taken it upon himself to make a man's decision and so shall face the consequences of it. If he should fail, if he should leave a single soul living to bring the shame of retribution upon this kingdom, then he will be, he shall be exiled. Um, of course, they get to King Linguine's, or Lingi's empire or kingdom, and they start seeing soldiers kind of come out guarding the area, of course. So, of course, they want to do a sneak attack to kind of take them out first. So they do. Shoot some arrows, shoot some, shoots it on fire, and shoots out the guards before it's before they can enter back into the kingdom. Um, they lay their dead, of course. Siegfried's army goes into the kingdom and starts to invade. Now, um, again, we're not going to go too much into the battle battle part, but we do see Siegfried go to King Linguine's quarters. Now, he, of course, sits there and he goes, he asks them, who are you? And he goes, does the name Sigmund Volsung ring any bells? And he and Linguine or Lingi sits there and says, I see. Well, please permit me one favor and ask it quick and make it quick. And he does pretty much kills him. It's also head. interesting to note that we don't see Linky doing well. Yeah. He is not the strong, capable ruler that we saw in the flashback. He is balding. His fingers are skeletal. He's wearing what looks like sackcloth. Yes. Now, uh-huh. he looks like he looks like what a peasant would look like during this time frame. And, and he looks extremely gaunt. There's... He's extremely skinny. There's no meat on his bones. Even the lanky teenager Siegfried has more muscle on him than Lingi at this point. Um, so we're really seeing too, not just Siegfried's situation, but we're also seeing what the sort of dishonor that Lingi brought about himself reaps in the long term. Right. Now and his resignation to being killed by a Volsung, I think, speaks too to the consequences of Linky's actions and the sort of recklessness and the consequences of rage um that's not thought through right and that's it, it's 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 kind of like the pot called the kettle black in this situation because of the fact being that Lingy did it now look what's happening here and it's one of those things it's so interesting to see a little bit more but we do find out pretty much that the barracks have been cleared that not a single soul survived at this point and Pretty much he continues to have them search, make sure of this, you know, and then to have the have the rest of the men prepare the funeral pyres. You know, you heard your royal, you know, of course, they continue and they get everything done. They're victorious. They sail back to their kingdom. Now, they return to King Al's castle, but of course, here comes the king, pissed. And he goes, men, return to your barracks and confine yourselves there until further notice. It would seem that you have been deceived by your royal prince and so they all leave him and he goes no you don't my boy not today yes you're right to be ashamed now come with me and it seems you have some explaining to do so he starts to question him and he goes have i not been good to you Siegfried?" and he goes yes my lord but how am i to believe this well when i your adopted father and your king have given you my only child all that you could ever need yet still you betray my most explicit of instructions and he, and he goes, I understand the desire for vengeance for the wrongs of the past, but our kingdom has thrived on a maintained peace with our neighbors. If a single soul from King Lingi's kingdom survived, it could be, it could be, it could ruin everything. And he goes, there is not. I saw it to myself. And he goes, now leave me. And one last thing, Siegfried. I've spoken to my men. They know not to accept another order from you until you are a man of the kingdom. So keep yourself out of trouble, won't you? And he walks out. Now he goes to Re- Reagan. Now at this point, Siegfried goes, "Okay," he tells him, "I'm ready to go take this guy on. I'm ready to take on the dragon. I'm ready to take down Fafnir." And he goes, "So of course Reagan goes, of course, great. I'm going to go get myself be there in a moment." So they ride off into the wilderness. Now, you know it'll be best to stop here, and pretty much tells him at this point, Siegfried needs to go in alone. Reagan's going to stay behind with Grant. But he tells him at first, he goes, you know, I'll, I'll follow you close behind to act as a lookout. One more thing, my lord. Fafnir routinely wades out into the ocean to drink. Wait until he does. Sneak into the bay 
bury yourself under the sand and wait his return. And so, and when he's above you, thrust it, Graham, in, deep into his heart. This is the best way to kill him. Now, he does that. We see Fafnir, which, by the way, beautiful art with the dragon. I've seen this, and I'm like, this. The dragon is gorgeous. Um, now, we see him go get drinks, like, like Reagan said. And, of course, he buries himself in the sand while, of course, Fafnir is walking back because he's hearing things. But all of a sudden, when he starts walking back, the sword, the sword is thrusted, or Graham is thrusted into Fafnir. Now, Fafnir really coming up to confront him. Now, he, you know, of course, he's taunting him like, that's a little boy run, and he goes, you insult me. I've raised entire kingdoms to the ground, melted whole armies with the poisonous spray of my fangs, and you think you, a mere boy, can simply walk in into, into my domain and kill me. The great Fafnir with nothing more than a knife. And I sent and I know who sent you. It was that cowardly little Reagan. And then he goes, How could you possibly know that? And he goes, Because he's always been a coward. It's just like him to send someone like you in here to die on his behalf, too yellow to do his own bidding, and all because he desires that damned ring. His greedy heart has desired that ring ever since it became part of our family. Family or Siegfried responds, he goes, didn't he, he didn't tell you? Of course not. What would he stand to gain from telling you that he's my brother? Now... And this is also, um, I think we skipped over this a little bit, but Reagan is following behind Siegfried yeah. on this mission. That That's what I... That's why I um, And he specifically says he's going to follow, he's going to follow behind as a scout. Now, I don't know about you, but scouts typically go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> they don't follow behind. We do find out more about this is that he continues on with the story and he says, and I bet he also forgot to tell you the ring he desires allows the wearer to see where all the gold of earth resides. Suppose for just one second that you succeeded in slaying me today, do you actually think he'd let you walk out of here with even so much as a single piece of the treasure I guard? And, and he goes, not a chance. Look around you. He's abandoned you. He's nowhere to be found. And he goes, that's the only sign you need that he stabbed you in the back the first chance he got. But let me share a little secret with you. The ring is cursed. None who see it can resist it. And once it in possession of it, the wearer of everyone they've never known is destined to die. And we see him try. He escapes somehow, gets behind a rock and tries to grab his sword. And he does. Where he tries to stab further in. Now, I kind of want to talk about, you know, of course, he does at this point slay the dragon or slay Fafnir. Um, but he's wondering where Reagan is. Now, he's try trying to find Reagan, but of course, you see Reagan literally sitting behind a bush in a fetal position. Now, I'm going to turn the mic over to Mary because this is play a big part of this story is when we get the backstory of Reagan and his brothers. Yes. Um, so we, and this is another thing that I, I think really also highlights something about Norse myth is that Reagan says, once upon a time, a lifetime ago, we were a very normal family. Our father, the sorcerer king, Hreidmar, was the linchpin that held it all together. Until one day, the gods Odin, Loki, and Hornir roll rode into our little corner of Midgard. And what brings the Aesir to my shores this evening? The gods revealed their crime. Lost in the lake and overcome with hunger, the gods had killed an otter for food. It was only when they'd killed their prey that they realized their mistake. It was no otter at all. It was Oter, my brother. He'd been using the sorcery he'd learned from my father to catch fish in the form of an otter when the gods came upon him. It was then father made his demand for restitution. The only trouble was he demanded that the gods find enough gold to cover the entire body of Otir. The gods didn't know where to find such treasures, but father did not relent. And the gods had no choice but to walk the length and breadth of Midgard in search of all the gold the lands had to offer. The gods had almost procured enough gold to cover the body of Otir, almost. So this is this is started because the gods acted dishonorably. Mm -hmm. 
they accidentally killed someone's son and have to pay restitution for it. So this sort of plays into this idea that the gods are not infallible in North mythology. That is not a cultural norm for the ancient and early medieval Norse, um, especially not before the transitional era during the conversion to Christianity. Um, that's just not something that we see in this time period. Um, and it's something that we don't that we see in a bunch of other cultures as well. So where in Irish mythology, the gods are just people, they're just guys. Um, they're not even like representations for different natural phenomena. And so that's just sort of something that we're seeing in this whole corner of um, Northern Europe, really, where the gods are not infallible. They are not omnipotent. They are not omniscient. Um, they have flaws and faults and very human-like qualities. Um, and because they have these human-like qualities, they have to also obey things like human laws. Um, and so in legal codes um, from the time period, um, if you accidentally kill someone, you do have to pay their family some sort of restitution. Um, a lot of times because there aren't any like true prison systems in this time period, um, legal codes from these from this time tend to focus more on monetary payments um, to the affronted family. Um, and so we see this a lot. Um, so this sort of situation specifically, um, if you accidentally kill someone, if you cripple someone, if you assault someone, um, it's not so much like you get put into a prison because prisons didn't exist. It's the affronted family has certain legal avenues through which they can force restitution. Um, oftentimes this is monetary payment. This can be livestock or it could be you're going to die. <laughs> and all of these things depend on the crime. Um, now, of course, the social status of whoever did the affront is definitely put into play when courts are deciding this sort of thing. Um, so the fact that these are the Esir that are have made this mistake um, definitely is a factor as to why this is not, oh, eye for an eye, now you get to be killed. Um, it's, you have to pay us a lot of money. Right. Um, and because the gods cannot find this money, um, they don't have quite enough in all of Midgard. Um, they have to go to another one of the realms. Um, so they go to the Quave Dellings of the Dwarf and Vari um, with a magical net in hand. Um, now this magical net is in some ways something that inspires um, Wonder Woman's lasso, by the way. <laughs> Um, just to bring another comic connection in here, um, it is unbreakable. Um, it doesn't procure truth, but it is one of those mythological materials that does lend itself to the Wonder Woman mythos. Um, and Loki catches the dwarf, um, and demands the dwarf's golden ring. Now, of course, he knows that the ring is cursed. Um, and this is, again, one of those things, Loki is the god of mischief. He's a trickster by nature. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, insert, he does do what's needed. He does procure gold to finish the price that the gods must pay. But there's a twist to it. Um, he specifically gives them something cursed, knowing that it will bring about ruin. Right. Now, this is where we get to Reagan. Now, Reagan, we find out there's three brothers. Because if I'm not mistaken, one's named Odin, one named Fafnir, and one named Reagan. There's Oter, Oter my Fafnir, bad. and Reagan. Yep. Yeah. So at this point, Oter is killed in this case. And now it's Fafnir and um, Reagan. So, and he goes, dark powers that would become a curse in the hands of anyone other than the ring's creator. So this is when their father comes and and states, Fafnir, my boy, how long has it been down? Have you been down here? How long has it been since you've slept? And it and he kept on saying it because you can see he's so obsessed with this ring. Now, and even the king says the damn ring, isn't it? It's if it's going to have this kind of effect on you, I'm left with no choice but to hide it away. As the king starts to grab for it, though. Reagan is standing at the door looking in and notices that Fafnir stabs him. 
or stamps their father to get the ring. Now, again, another scent of a hobbit or Lord of the Rings with Gollum. Um, now, and it's not just Gollum too that we're seeing with this. The ring is also reminiscent of the Arkenstone. Yes. Um, so it's sort of functioning as the inspiration for both of these things. But we also see um, Fafnir put the put on the ring, yeah. and he is transformed. Yes, and in a dragon. Um, and. Now, I know that not everyone has the kind of encyclopedic knowledge of the Chronicles of Narnia that uh, Brandon and I have. <laughs> um, but there once was a man, boy, unfortunately named Eustace Scrub. He almost deserved it. And something very similar happens to him in C.S. Lewis's The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. And he too is transformed into a dragon yeah. due to greed. <laughs> what I said, I, I, what was it? I've, I've read Lord of the Rings, or not Lord of the Rings, but also Chronicles of Narnia. I couldn't tell you how many times. And I'm not going to lie, when I read this, I did not put that two and two together. So I'm glad you brought that point up because it was interesting to see that. And and of course, like Lewis and Tolkien were best friends. Yes. Their works inspired each other in many ways. So it makes sense. And we also, Lewis does pull from various Northern European mythologies in the creation of Narnia and the lore within this sort of pocket dimension that is Narnia. Um, so seeing him sort of reference this kind of transformation with Eustace makes a lot of sense. Now, we go back to the present. Now, what happens is is that Siegfried pretty much has um, has um, Regan or Reagan literally at sword point. He's about to kill, and he continues. From that day, my life became consumed by seeking vengeance upon Fafnir. The gods only know how my father's armies tried to kill him, and but not a single soul survived an encounter with the beast. I fled, the last left alive, until I reached your lands. So you must believe me, my lord. And of course. He continues, I only deceived you to secure your strength to kill Fafnir and bring justice to my father's soul. And, of course, Siegfried understands because he's been on that trail. He understands the fact that he just went on this to avenge his father. And now he tells him to come on, let's get up, let's continue our journey. Our journey's not over yet, let's continue on. Now, they go down the mountain of course they go to Fafnir's body now Fafnir's still there and what's interesting is Reagan goes help me to cut out Fafnir's heart now and he continues to know I know you sought vengeance on your brother this is Siegfried saying but is mutilation of a corpse not just a step too far with Reagan continuing on to eat a cooked dragon's heart is to gain godlike agility temporary as it may be you may not need it, young as you are, but as an old man, and but he stopped and says, so what are you waiting for? Now, they light up a fire, of course, they do cut out the heart of Fafnir, and they put it on top of the fire to start cooking it. Now, they start noticing it's bubbling already, and, Fa and Reagan goes, don't let it burn or it'll turn to ash in a blink of an eye. And so... What's interesting is Siegfried actually says, let me taste it. And he sticks his finger in the heart and we shall see if it's not enough to carve, you know. So he licks the finger and what's interesting, he turns around and sees two crows still sitting there. And he goes, it looks as the most peculiar as though these can understand our words. Now, Reagan understands this and says, what's so fascinating about birds? You know, and of course he's ignoring it. Siegfried is just kind of like staring off in the Wonderland a little bit. And and he finally cut, snaps back into it and he says, oh yes, it's ready to go, let's eat it. Now, he carves it and of course Reagan just dies right in and he goes, what are you waiting for? Take a slice, eat. And what's interesting is that Siegfried doesn't eat right away. And he goes, and Reagan kind of continues on and says, seriously, you just killed a formidable dragon and now you're going to be squeamish about eating its heart. Just eat it up, my lord. The more you think about it, the harder it'll be to do it. And so Siegfried finally chomps down. But 
it's interesting. It can also be noted too that part of Siegfried's um, hesitance might also be that half deer's blood hurt him. Yeah. Um, immediately after him slaying the dragon. Um, and also, he just learned that this is Regan's brother, and Regan is eager to consume his heart. And of course, with the two crows, um, now, of course, Odin has been a presence that has kind of flittered in and out throughout this whole story, but he very famously does have two crows that he sends out throughout Midgard to look at the realm and report back to him. These are, of course, Hugin and Munin. Um, which are, um, their names mean thought and memory. Um, and so the power of the gods that it seems as though Siegfried is receiving are not so much strength and agility, but understanding. Yes. Like, it's granting him the maturity that Odin had requested him to show earlier in the narrative. Yes. Now, after this, of course, you know, Reagan starts to question things like what's going on but so Siegfried kind of tells him like hey come on let's go down you know sundown's about to happen let's go or that's Reagan saying that and he goes the ring my ring and you see that I love that little bubble where you just see his one face and then he turns to dark again and I love that little scene of it and so they go into the cave of of uh, Fafnir now what's interesting is that you see Reagan pulling out a knife and the crows are actually squawking at him to pay attention now what's interesting is that Siegfried it's like we said it's now has gotten that knowledge that or understanding that he knows something's about to go down and he pulls out Graham and of course you know Reagan cowering down again drops a knife and he goes Fafnir was right wasn't he he said you would try to kill me and of course, Reagan tries to plead with him, like, hey, please forgive me, Master. I am weak, but you can't, you don't understand. You couldn't possibly understand. It's that damn ring. I need it. No, I needed it. And I needed it in, with such desire, and it drove me mad, mad enough to try and kill you, my lord. But my sanity has returned to me, my lord, as I promise you. Fafnir was right above about you, Reagan. You are a coward, and betrayal is a crime that can, I cannot forgive. And at this point, we see him cut off Reagan's head. And he it... carries it with him. Yeah. And it's Siegfried that picks up the ring. And, puts and he it... doesn't just pick it up, but he puts it on. And there's a noticeable change in the way that he carries himself once he has the ring. Yes. And it's, I think it's worth noting that by this point, he is well aware of the corrupting power of the ring. He is more than aware of the curse. And he still makes the conscious choice to put it on. Now, at this point, he does throw the head over the gold. And that's, and then he walks out of that cave with the ring on his finger. And that's ends this story as of right now. Now, there is a second part. It looks like it's coming out. Um, is this book one of two? The second book hasn't come out at this point in time. Um, but I have to give Mary props there. Mary, you chose a excellent story to really cover, and I'm waiting for the second book to drop because I'm it's so it's I'm excited. Um, also, it was just a book that I felt covered a lot of different topics mm -hmm. that um, comics usually don't, especially ones that are focused on history um and it doesn't so much cover them in the way that we're used to comics covering history but it more so references them so it's sort of relying on you to want to look more into it um which i think is a really fun way of looking at this um because the way that I mean he talks about the unification of germany like obviously this doesn't happen in the medieval period but if you try to look at it, you're going to find more about the Weimar Republic. You're going to end up learning about World War One, World War Two. You're going to learn all about that, um, and you're going to look. You're going to end up learning about legal codes from the medieval period. You're going to find all of the really interesting ways that, in some cases, um, medieval legal codes were at times more egalitarian than some of our modern ones. Um, just lots of really interesting things that you can look at. And of course, he specifically references the syncretism, which is just so fascinating. The 
we tend to have this idea of the medieval world as being insular and entirely self-contained into these neat little boxes. And it very much was not. Um, the concept of a global society was not started with the advent of steam-powered sea travel or airplanes or the internet. Um, global travel and global exchange had been a thing for centuries. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a lot slower. <laughs> Now, but I think this is such a great tale, and, and once the second book drops, I would really love to do the next history through comics with this. Because that could be really fun. Yeah, I'd love to see how the story continues on. Um, but yeah, I think this is a great way to end the podcast. Um, what was it? As always, you can find Mary and I with Will and our other teammates um, on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Comic Talkers to get all the newest updates on the podcast and also join in on the conversation. You can listen to the podcast, this specific podcast on YouTube, um, but you can also listen to all our other content for comic book and anime content on Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Apple Podcasts. Um, this will be a YouTube exclusive um, where we go over stories that are based around history um, and bring it to life a little bit more. Um, Mary and I will be streamlining this on straight, like we said, straight up on YouTube. So please subscribe to the channel. Um, hit that bell notification so you never miss an episode. And without and without further ado, my name is Brandon. And I'm Mary. And may comics always be the top of your discussion.